For many years, Adobe Flash was the standard for creating interactive websites and games online. However, with the onset of better alternatives such as HTML5 and WebGL, on December 31st, 2020, Adobe ceased their support of Flash players across all browsers. And because of this, many online Flash games that didn't have substantial communities failed to be archived and were forever lost to time. Not every game had to meet such a depressing fate. Some games have the privilege of being archived and thus our nostalgia for the games in question can be relived and preserved for all eternity, at least to an extent. Chess Kids Archive is an ARG slash digital horror series that aims to emulate exactly the scenario that I just described. This website used to be a platform for children to play online games and have fun. What could possibly have gone wrong? The video will be divided into five main sections. The first section will cover the Chess Kids archive itself. The second will cover the first part of the website. The third will cover all the other social media platforms. The fourth will cover the final portion of the website. And finally, the fifth section will be for theory and analysis. Before we really begin, I would like to give a brief viewer discretion warning since this series covers some heavy topics and occasionally shows some disturbing imagery. With all that being said, let's dive right into it. The first video was released on February 20th, 2022. I will be using the Chess Kids Archive Instagram to supplement the visuals occasionally since the archival YouTube videos tend to be pretty low in quality. The first video starts with a little jingle and a low quality screen which we have access to a better version of. The screen says, created by Sarah R. Trills, and the Instagram post says, apparently this was the screen that played when you opened the website as a way to thank the creator, Sarah Trills. And with that, we're introduced to one of the most important characters in the whole series. Then we transition into what seems like a main menu or hub for the website with three main buttons. The first one leads to a town, but the person recording goes back to the main menu and clicks on the center button, which leads to this page. But the screen begins to glitch. The portrait from the beginning is shown again, but this time it's empty. Then it transitions into another screen and we briefly see a different menu until it glitches again and the video just ends. Now, we do have access to a higher quality version of the menu we briefly saw, and it seems to be the game's menu that you'd access by clicking this button. This game's menu actually gives us a date for Chess Kids, 2000-2003. However, the very next video is labeled 2000-2004, which means the previous footage was most likely recorded before 2004? Something like that. This time, the footage shows one of the games that used to be available, Reading with Ben. The story the person recording chooses to read is Trouble on Mayhill Farm. The video quality is too poor to make out any of the words, but the Instagram version actually attempts to transcribe the words so we can read them, but it may not be 100% accurate. I'll go ahead and read the story now. Way down on the hillside of Maryland, Oregon lived Harry the Red Cat. Every day, he tended to his crops and lived a happy life alone from anyone. Harry was happy. Harry was free as a farm cat. One day, it was hot out, and Harry saw his crops were beginning to wilt. He panicked and worried all his hard work would be for nothing. All his berries? Gone. His carrots? Gone. His flowers and peas? Gone. It was now or never. Harry knew that without rain, he couldn't have his crops grow, so he thought and he thought until he got an idea. 
To save his crop, Harry would have to take the water from his water heater inside his little house and cover his farm in the water. Sure, it's boiling, but it has to work. From there, we seem to get visuals of Harry going to retrieve the water, but something doesn't really seem right. Uh, though the YouTube version doesn't offer much more insight from here, the Instagram version with the transcription has a secret message hidden within this ending sequence. It seems to be an excerpt from a developer interview, though it's not entirely legible. I'm not actually going to read out this interview because uh, it's played for us very soon. I just wanted to let you guys know that we technically did have access to it before. Now, I don't have access to any high quality footage of this next sequence, and it doesn't seem to have any connection to the games that we can see on the first page. The text in the center says, press one, and upon pressing any button, an image appears. The first shows a kitten, the second shows a very distorted image of what appears to be a man. Uh, honestly, I thought it resembled this painting of Jesus, which might be important for later. The next shows an off-putting depiction of what appears to be a monkey. I don't know, I really don't know what this is. And the next is a liminal looking photo of a pathway at night. The website begins to go haywire once again, and a dark image displays. From there, it cuts back to the main menu, and the video ends. The next video is footage of another game called Forest Adventure, which may be related to Forest Journey on the game's menu, but I'm not sure. It starts with an open field in a forest with a house. Upon clicking on the house to enter it, we can see three different photos on the wall and a red flower in a pot on a table in the corner. The picture in the top right is something we can see on the Instagram. The one on the bottom is a blue background with a green and a red silhouette with possibly a heart between them, and the one on the top left that the player ends up clicking is what prompts Forest Adventure. So, the game itself uses real images of a forest at night, along with like clip art of clickable signs and other things that seem to progress the adventure. When we get to this spot in the forest, we encounter that same red and yellow flower from before. A few screens pass, but then we arrive here. A missing person poster appears. We don't know the character on it yet, but this will be very important later. Then it transitions into an actual video of someone walking through the woods. During this footage, the captions actually say at the 2 minute and 50 second mark, Then we seem to cut to an interview with Sarah. This is the interview that I said that we would hear later. What inspired you to make a kid's website? You and your team. Well, gosh, you know, I'd say it, it goes back a while. I've always been into coding and making little things for my friends to share around. You know, I've been messing with computers since I was able to type. My dad was a technical engineer, so we would get all that stuff early. Um, but, you know, I'd say specifically, chess.com really isn't just a kid's website. It's an entertainment website. Anyone can enjoy our games. There are probably things in that game that will go over kids' heads, and then things that older people really wouldn't understand. But we wanted to make it something accessible, something something fun for everybody. How big is the team working on your website? Well, including me, it's about six or seven. I do most of the coding. My friend Ellen, uh, Ellen Masterson, does all the artwork. All of it. Everyone else helps with coding and music and sound and video and just doing everything they can to make Chez.com stand out be its own thing. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. We definitely we really give it our all for all of us pouring our blood, sweat, and tears into it. Before we continue, I just want to highlight that we've been introduced to a new character. 
Ellen, who is responsible for the art, and we've been told that about six or seven people total work on the website. After this interview segment ends, we cut back to the screen with the flower from before. Now, originally when the player clicked on the red flower in the previous screen, it didn't do anything. But if the player clicks on the red flower after the interview is done playing, they're treated to another video of someone walking through the forest. Until we're suddenly back in the house. The picture from before has changed. The background is now black and the red silhouette has turned gray. And the same missing person poster shows up, only this time it's for Sarah. The player gets forcefully booted to the main hub, and then the video just ends. It is important to note that in this video's description, there is a deviation for the first time, in that it says Sarah Trills is still missing to this day, please contact the Grey Pass police station with any information that may help us uncover. And then it transitions back into this lost website or any screen caps. Now, so far, we've covered three entries in the series. The fourth entry is a compilation of those first three with some added bonus content, so I'm gonna go ahead and explore only everything that is new within this video. First off, it begins with what seems like interviews of people who actually remember the Chess.com website. I barely remember anything about it, though. All I remember is that it was quite buggy, there was some game about a forest, and that it ran on Flash. I hope this somehow helps. Hey there. I came across your account on Instagram and just wanted to send a quick thank you email. My little brother and I played on Shea Kids all the time when we were little, but I had completely forgot about it until I saw your archive. That's when all the nostalgia came flooding back. I do not remember much from that website, but dot comma. All I know it was that I used to play it with during school recess. One of my fave games was the Kabuki, or how it was called. I do not remember much of the others, I do only played one. The rest of the website was pretty buggy, and the page will freeze every time I try to click K on one, while scratching I do played other. It was the forest one, but at one point the web closes, and it was hard to reach the final level. Also, whatever happens to Sarah, hopes she's okay. God bless her son. Based on the things that they say, it seems like the buggy nature of the website is universal, and not just something that we're seeing as the audience. From there, the rest of the episode plays out as semi-normal, until the extras portion at the end. There seems to have been a spot on the website with profiles to learn about each character, but the quality is rather low, so it's difficult to actually make out any of the details. There does exist a cleaner version of Chester's character profile though, and in that we get to find out that the squares in the corner are actually the character's favorite food and favorite knickknack. Now, for the most part, we either can't tell what it is or it looks super strange, either way, super low quality, but there are a few of them that are worth paying attention to. For instance, this character right here that we've never actually met before, Kabuko has a completely blank slot for both her favorite food and favorite knickknack for seemingly no reason whatsoever. Harry's character profile is also kind of strange in that I have no idea what his favorite food is meant to be here and his favorite knickknack seems to be like a plushie of himself or something. If you remember the first time the missing person poster showed, we got to see Woodsy, and her character profile does briefly show up here. Her favorite food seems to be depicted as a honeycomb, but her knickknack is completely blank. But not blank in the same way as Kabuko's, blank as in a black void. 
That's not the only strange anomaly on this page though, as there seems to be a real person hiding in the background. This character may be a representation, whether vague or direct, of the missing Sarah Trills. Using this logic, it could be said that maybe this parallel can be drawn between other characters in the future, but we'll just have to wait and see. Alright, let's back up a bit, since this seems like a good point to do that. What do we know? There's a website that used to exist called Chess Kids or Chess.com that has a hub for online children's games from around 2000 to 2004 until it suddenly disappeared. It was created by Sarah Trills, her friend Ellen, and a handful of other developers that we've yet to meet. The glitchy and buggy nature of the website is something that happened to at least a few people who remember playing on it. At some point, the creator of the website, Sarah, went missing, and according to the video description on the third episode, is still missing to this day. There's our recap. Now we can dive into the longest video in the series, clucking in at almost 26 minutes, which is found footage of a birthday minigame. The video begins in the town that we briefly saw in a previous entry, but it then returns to the games page. The player clicks the next page and we get to see the second page of games for the first time. After clicking on a game, we see the instruction screen for a birthday surprise, though I can't really read it. Then an in-game cutscene plays. Oh, hi. I haven't seen you around. Can I tell you something on my mind? And you gotta promise not to tell anybody. My friend Lola's having a birthday party. She was going pretty smooth until that storm came by last night and totally blew all the presents all over the town. You know, I'm just one cat. There's, there's only a little bit I can do, but uh, if only I had some help. Uh, that gives me an idea. Uh, you could help me, right? Awesome. All right, around the town, there'll be some gifts and items like cake, presents, balloons, anything that would work with a party. If you see something, click on it with your mouse. There'll be signs around town to help direct you on where to go. If you see any of my friends around, they might have some clues to help you out. Also, make sure you don't tell Lola. After it ends, the game starts. The first present seems to be a necklace, and Chester congratulates us for finding it. Afterwards, the player checks the phone to hear a message left from Hopper talking about Harry wanting to buy some carrots from Chester. Hello, no one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone. After seeing everything there is to see in this room, the player exits to find themselves at a crossroads with Lola standing in front of them. it for you this time. After you're done talking to Lola, you move on to a hillside with a windmill and get to talk to Ticking Tim. It's worth noting that the red flowers from before are once again present on this hillside. He says that he may or may not know the location of some of the lost presents, and that you have to best him in a game of his choice in order to get them back, so he's Kind of just being an asshole. The player declines, however, and ventures into the windmill alone to find a gift. This time, it appears to be a yo-yo. Before Chester can finish congratulating you, an alarm starts playing for whatever reason, and the player enters a room and finds the phone again. Issues with 
I'll be back when you can. The message this time seems to be from a real person. After the phone call ends, we cut to the roof of the windmill, find some party hats, and then we're back on the main floor. After exiting and talking to Tim again, his dialogue is now so loud that it's too distorted to properly understand, but I can make out some of it. And it's the same lines from before. This time the player accepts, and we play Tim's Tic Tac Talk, which we may have already seen on the game menu at some point. And for those who are really paying attention, you can see Sarah's face is actually in the center of the tic-tac-toe board. You beat Tim the first time, and he blatantly cheats to win the second time, but on the third match... The gift that you receive for defeating Tim is, fittingly, a little pocket watch. The next area leads us to Benny the Bear. For some reason, he approaches us, says nothing, and then just leaves. From there, we get to enter the tree with a door on it, which leads to a dark, candlelit section. The player finds another present, but this time... to you in the studio and then it's like uh it's like whenever i try to talk outside of work you just aren't very receptive so i just you know wasn't believing if everything was okay between us um if you want to talk about something you can After the phone call ends, we take the final path, which seems to lead to Harry's house, but he doesn't appear to be home at the moment. For some reason, the present animation begins without the player doing anything at all, and Harry's gift seems to be the same red flowers that we've been seeing the whole time, red gerbera daisies, specifically. Another gift shows up, and the background glitches into the room we started in, and the player clicks on the phone. As suddenly as it began, the chaos ends, and we're in a bright green room with a familiar face.
The website then boots the player back to the main menu and the video abruptly ends. Now, the next video is much shorter, and it seems to depict the intended minigame ending cutscene that we were meant to see just now. Happy birthday! It's your birthday party, silly. Before we get to the next long episode, I would like to briefly speak about the less important videos that precede them. There are 5 songs and a 12 second walk cycle animation. 4 of the songs seem to be just songs and nothing else, added for the sake of immersion, but the final one seems to be a Valentine's song performed by Chester himself, and based on the information we've learned, it seems like it may have some relevance to the overall story. I'll point out a few of the lines in the song now that I think have some significance. It's also a real song, uh, I'll Get You by the Beatles. The next video is another one that's about 20 minutes long, and it seems to be games that were themed around Harry's farm, which we learned about a while back. It starts with the player running into Harry, who then asks for help on the farm. Say, if you weren't too busy, could you help me out with all of this? You will help me? Ray, here, my farm is right this way. Here we are, tons of farm activities, and lucky for you, I, I need some help with all of them. The first minigame involves helping Hopper, who accidentally spilled ink all over the vegetables that they were supposed to help Harry pick. The goal is to identify which vegetable they are, and to win the game. Now you may notice that there's a certain someone peeking from behind the fence in the background, but it's never really deliberately said, and she doesn't really do anything. This game seems to actually go perfectly normal, which is pretty rare as far as Chess Kids goes. Afterwards, the player clicks on a corn who looks like he's high out of his mind and tells some awful jokes. <laughs> Here's a good one for you. What did the truthful asparagus say to the rude peach? You're rotten to the pit. <laughs> The next game involves picking a carrot for a contest, and Harry tells you to pick the biggest one. After doing that, though, you can hear the person recording fumbling with their keyboard to try and make it do something. At least, that's what it seems like on a surface level, but in reality, it's something very different. This is one of the few times in the entire series that we very deliberately hear keyboard noises, and it's because earlier in the video there is a cipher in the captions, and it translates to, To press is big carrot three times and type embittered into keyboard to access his real voice. Make sure microphone and webcam is turned on will never, never work without. It almost seems like the person that was recording was being led to this blue heart easter egg intentionally. The game glitches, and we see a very strange visual that actually matches something that we'll get to see far later down the line in the video, and we're booted back to the beginning. But this time, it's glitched. It briefly shows an image of what seems to be a real barn, and eventually we're forced into playing a fruit quiz. But the game is already broken beyond repair. 
It might not seem like an important detail for now, but the fact that the game breaks and shows Sarah when the player clicks on cherries will be relevant in the near future. After this ends, we're taken to a point and click adventure style forest section where we have to gather items on Harry's checklist. We meet a new character who asks for oil to loosen his joints, but he's kind of just ignored. We don't really know what he means as far as I know, so... After collecting a few more items, the player stumbles upon a notebook labeled Poems for Sarah. It can be assumed then that since we are on a mission to recover things that belong to Harry, that this book probably belongs to Harry. The first three poems don't seem to have too much in the realm of significance, at least on a surface level. Though I think it's very interesting that the first poem uses honey, which is Woodsy's favorite food, and the second uses the cherry lips, which parallels the cherry and Sarah that I just talked about a bit ago. It's when we get to the fourth poem that things start to get a little interesting. I'm gonna read the poems as we go along. Between the thorns and the petals. Now watch, he said. Remember to pluck between the thorns and the petals, or else your fingers will get pricked. She nods and says, I understand. Now, white roses switch to pink. Now understand, she said. Remember to set the table. Knives to forks to spoons. He nods and says, I understand. Now, white tablecloth switch to pink. Though I don't have a super direct interpretation of this, it is worth noting that the he in the poem gives the she a destructive task that seems to make her bleed, whilst the he is given a relatively safe task in setting the table. The tablecloth and rose both being stained pink seems to me to imply in some form blood is shed, despite the tasks having differing levels of inherent danger. I believe that in vague terms this may be the point right before Harrison and Sarah's relationship took a dive off the deep end, so to speak. Assuming these are written in order, this is also supported by the dramatic escalation in the very next poem. Smiling Man Smiling Man lived in the Smiling Flat, up on Smiley Hill. He lived his smiley life, every day working a smiley job, with his smiley kids and smiley wife. Her name was Barbara, I think. One day, Smiling Man went out of his smiley work early, saying hello to smiley passerbys, grabbing smiling groceries, getting into his smiling car, heading home to his smiley life and smiley kids and smiley wife, when suddenly his smiling flat began to cry, 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 cry. Oh, smiley wife, he called out. I think her name was Barbara. But all was left. Upon the fridge was a note that said goodbye. Crying man lives in a crying flat, up on crying hill. He lived his smiley life her name was Barbara, if I remember correctly. Okay, so this one has a lot to unpack. I believe this poem may represent the happy life that Harrison had or wanted to have with Sarah before everything went wrong. Earlier in the birthday minigame video, there is a photo of a lady in a dress and a man in a suit that appears twice. Now, in case it wasn't overwhelmingly obvious enough, this is... Sarah and Harry, the other human male character that we've seen in the series so far. Her hairstyle is the same, she's wearing a green dress, and his hairstyle is the same, and we see this image during our confrontation with Woodsy towards the end of the video. We know at this point that Woodsy is a representation of Sarah. It's also very important to pay close attention to the wording in the poem. Smiling Man lived his smiley life, and Crying Man lives in a crying flat. It seems like Harrison was a very emotional and perhaps unstable individual. 
though it is a bit understandable at the very least to be upset about a breakup. The next poem, however, devolves into the realm of deranged ramblings. The way we love. The way we love, the way we love. Grown-ups say the love is farce. Grown-ups say we don't know because we are young. Grown-ups warn us of the danger. Grown-ups try and tell us we don't know forever. Love is the way we hold each other. Love is the happy apples we eat. Love is the candy clouds, the green grass, the sweet dew of morning, the empty room, the curls, the hair in the sink, the way you talk to me, the way you tell me what's wrong with me, the way you talk to me, the way you don't talk to me, the way you talk behind my back, the way you lie to me, the way you never listen to me, the way you encourage me, the way you yell at me, the hair in the sick, the what we tell ourselves it's going to be okay, the way you spend money on me, the way you make me, the way you make me feel, the way you make me feel, the way I remember feeling, the way you make me feel, the way you talk to me, the way your lips curl when you smile at me, the way you call me bad names, the way you call me weak, the way you lie to me, the way you carve into me, the way you walk with me, the way you make me smile, the way that grown-ups don't understand, the way that love is the way that you talk to me, the way we love, the way you, the way you make me feel inside. I want the inside to be my outside. I want to feel love. Love is the way you feel. All right, well, that was pretty dramatic. Um, this poem isn't all too difficult to figure out. So Harrison is clearly distraught over either his breakup with Sarah or the fact that he is about to break up with Sarah or that he can see it happening in the near future. Um, and I think a lot of this poem may also be about things that happened uh, a long time ago. Because of the word grown-ups being used, it seems to be implying that at least some or maybe even all of the poem was written when they were younger and it simply parallels events that are happening later in his life, but obviously we don't really know. Um, the poem could have easily been written in, with Harrison in a headspace reminiscing about when they were younger as well, so we really don't know. Uh, the final poem feels like it de-escalates quite a bit compared to the previous two. Farm Kitties Little bitty kitty, sitting in a farm, he doesn't belong, all the other animals eat on the farm. Pig, cow, horse, sheep, chicken. Maybe the farm cat likes to be in the farm for reasons other than eating the farm food. Sleeps on the hay, licks his paws, self-soothe. And at the bottom of the page signed, For you, my love, Harrison Michaels. I think this final poem, if Harry is meant to be taken as a direct representation of Harrison, may be talking about Harry the farm cat, or Harry the farm cat is a character that was created because of Harrison's existing feelings. But I don't believe we have very strong evidence for any other interpretations, though it, to me, might be an introspection into how Harrison feels about how those in his life treat him. With this, the website forcefully boots the player who is recording back to the original homepage, and this video finally comes to an end. Now, I know that might have felt like a lot of information to take in, and it was, but I am glad to say that there are no more episodes that are that long, so everything else should be easier to consume in comparison. Let's recap the newer things that we've learned before moving on. We know a bit more about Harrison and Sarah's relationship, and that they likely had a good relationship at first, and at some point things started to get worse, until at some point Sarah broke up with or broke off an engagement with Harrison. The escalation may have eventually led to Sarah's death by Harrison's hands. This is a bit confusing, since we also know something happened to Harrison. There is also evidence because of character parallels that Harrison may have owned or lived on a farm and had access to farming equipment and a forest nearby. With that said, we can go ahead and bundle the next few videos into their own little section. The first video after Harry's farm is a 9 minute sound compilation. 
after listening to it, none of the sounds themselves seem to hold any significance that I can think of, but there is a face that appears at the end. As far as I know, we are not sure who exactly this face belongs to. The next four videos consist of two songs, a sound effect, and a 38 second video of someone manhandling the hell out of a Chester plush. The next two videos are both about two minutes long, but it's only the first one that we're actually interested in. You see, the first 20 to 30 or so seconds of the video are completely normal, but then we hear what sounds like distorted dialogue that we can't really make out. So, this should be pretty obvious, but this is speech, and it sounds kind of like Harrison speaking angrily, but I don't hear a second person. What I do hear in the background, though, is a reversed version of the Valentine's Chess Kids cover for some reason. And at the end of the video, we get to see a photo of Harrison and Sarah together. And the interesting thing here is that we have seen green and red silhouettes before. This was foreshadowed episodes before this. The next video is a 16-minute audio segment that seems to have been sent in through email by a third party. This video has yet to be solved, which is assuming it actually has a deeper meaning. Uh, apparently, uh, the people in the community went through hell and back to try and figure out what it meant and nothing ever really worked. The next video is a Christmas special that seems to have been made for the Christmas season of 2004. For most of the video, it's an innocent cover of Holly Jolly Christmas by Chester's voice actor. However, at about the two minute mark, We see Sarah's messed up face in shocking detail considering most of the series lacking quality, and I don't think I'm gonna be showing it here because that's just asking for YouTube to give me some consequences and it's a little fucked up. I will come back to it later because it's actually very important to my overall interpretation of the series events, but for now I'm going to leave it as it is. The next video is equally important in that same sense, and it involves footage of Chester on what seems to be like a built-in video player on the website. Sometimes, all you need to do is get outside and go on a nice walk. Like this one here. The forest seems almost like the forest that we've seen at night before several times. The person recording shows signs of audible frustration, and Chester has some very interesting lines in this video, too. You hear those sounds? At a minute and 56 seconds, Chester says, Loss is something that everybody has to deal with once in a while. The most we can do. So, after that line, we know this is definitely Harrison calling out for Sarah, but why in the woods? Well, we'll have to put a pin on that information, too. There's two more minor videos after this, that being a 40-second song with no significance and a 9-second mailbox animation, also seemingly with no significance. With that, we can finally move on to the final two public videos on the Chess Kids Archive channel so far, and those are the Halloween gameplay and the Easter special. The Halloween minigame begins with all of the main Chess Kids characters dressed up in costumes on Halloween night. Uh, since they can't decide what they want to do, they leave it up to the player to decide what activity they're going to perform. For some reason, the player is allowed to click on the gravestones in the background to travel to an unmarked one. 
Uh, after that, it takes until about halfway through the video for the player to actually initiate an activity, and they get transported into a hallway. But you may have noticed at this point that a character wearing a green sweater always signifies her. So, um, what the hell did we just witness? Well, the imagery depicted three admittedly very rough images of what seemed to be like a naked woman dancing around or something, and, and one of them was very similar to a position of crucifixion. Considering Woodsy is shown multiple times before and during the sequence, it can be assumed that this most likely has something to do with Sarah and her goodbye forever message can be a, a reference to her initial breakup with Harrison, or the fact that she's, you know, dead. Uh, the last public video we have so far seems to be this Easter special, though it's officially labeled as Chester Easter Egg Tossing Animation. It also includes a song that seems to talk about the story of the Christian Bible, how God created the earth and life and sent his son to earth to die for our sins and his subsequent resurrection. Though most of the lyrics are actually pretty vague, this is yet another reference to Jesus within the series. Also, this song is real as well. It's A Little Story by Daniel Johnston, a random song that came out in like 1980. I don't even think this one is a cover, it sounds just pitched and distorted. Now although this seems to be it for the videos, there are actually various unlisted videos, some of which were found through various clues, and others that used to be public in the past but for whatever reason no longer are. The first of these unlisted videos is a minute long, and it's called Happy Birthday. It depicts a room with a cake in it, and then this happens. and the video ends after Sarah's picture is shown. The next one is Sticking Your Nose, which shows art of Chester shushing the player with text that reads, you found a secret surprise. But when the player clicks on the red button, the background disappears and eventually so does Chester, until only this dark image remains. After that, we have possibly the funniest video in the entire series, which is Top 10 Excerpt, a video styled like a Chills Top 10 video. Yeah, the Burger King foot lettuce guy. The footage was submitted by a user named Lowell underscore M9, which, although much later in the video, I promise, <laughs> will be super important. The following video was just a teaser for the birthday minigame and shows no new information, so I'll go ahead and ignore that one. Hey, nice job. 
The next two unlisted videos are only really relevant when we get around to talking about something else later, so I'll put a pin in those for now. The one after those is the final unlisted archive video, and it's called Kabuko, written out in Japanese hiragana. Uh, the video starts on the game menu, but eventually shows footage of a game called Kabuko Haitatsu, which translates to Kabuko Delivery, and it features a new and surprisingly humanoid character for whatever reason, Kabuko. Yes, that was Sarah's messed up face again. Uh, if this was a normal digital horror series, this is probably where we would end the video. But this is an ARG. There is far more to this story than what lies on the surface. Almost like an iceberg. But where do we even start? Well, let's take a look at the official website. Welcome to the Chess Kids Archive website. This is the website homepage. I'll go ahead and go through all of the immediately available links on this homepage to start us off on this journey. The first link leads to a video that we've already seen, and these two YouTube channel links lead to the original Chess Kids and this. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm not going to talk about that channel right now. We're going to talk about that later. The next link is an email Q&A, which gives away a few more key details. I'll go ahead and read all of the questions and their answers now, and I'll pause if I have anything else to say. All right, let's begin. Hi, I'm just reaching out to ask how you guys find all of this data on Chess Kids. I remember playing it growing up, and I could never find any info. For a while, I thought it was just something I made up as a kid. <laughs> From Maddie. Hello Maddie. We are comprised of a medium-sized team of researchers, all who either remember playing slash hearing about chess.com when it was online, or just fans of lost media and the hunt for finding nostalgic remnants of the past. So you don't have to just remember anymore. We dig through lots of information sent into us at our email and our personal collections, as well as going through old data archives, trying to reach out to people involved with the project, and even trying to somehow backwards engineer the old site to run again. Anything really we can do to get our hands on some of that chessy knowledge. Hope that answers your question. So right off the bat, new character, Maddie, uh, and I'll just go ahead and say here that we are going to hear more about this person in the future. All right. Next question. What kind of person was Sarah Trills when she was making Chess.com? Could you tell us stuff about her before she started to make Chess.com, if possible? From Clock JPEG. Sarah R. Trills was the head designer and director behind Chess.com. She was a very bright and charismatic young woman who worked hard, earning acclaim from her peers in the programming field, even with a small development team. Ms. Trills created something that touched the hearts of many. We want to savor her legacy and her memory, and preserve all the magic behind Chess Kids for this new generation. A photo is below. Hope that answered your question. Dear Chess Kids Archive Team, what is your favorite color? From Winfill. A collective agreement of green. Hello. Can you tell us more about who's running the project? Maybe tell us your names and about yourselves. From Igor. We are a group of people who either enjoyed Chess Kids when it first came out and played it when we were younger, or we are enthusiasts in finding lost old media and recovering it to show in the present. Our names are unimportant, as we believe the search is what is most important to us and to our followers. Hope that answered your question. Have you been able to get in contact with anyone who formerly worked on the project, from the longest of all time? Not yet. We have tried many a time to contact those who worked on Chess Kids, and not one person has gotten through to us, but that won't stop us. We are getting new leads every day, so hopefully here, sooner or later, we can get a statement from those related to the project. Hope that answered your question. Now, this is a very important detail, because I think it's strange that despite being a very dedicated team of individuals archiving chess kids, 
that they somehow haven't managed to contact a single person that used to work on the website. It's not like the website was anything to be ashamed of, and as we'll learn from later details, I don't think this archival is taking place too long after the website actually existed anyways, but we'll get back to these points later on. Hello. What was your favorite game on Chess Kids? For those in the team who played it when they were little? From Glowboy22. Hmm, that's a good question. Of the games we have footage of, probably a toss-up between the Kabuko Deliver game and the Boat War game. That one we remember playing for hours. A runner-up would probably be all of the little mini-games on the Harry Farm Cat farm games. They were simple, but helped some of us learn names for fruits and vegetables. Hope that answered your question. Hello. Had you been able to know if Sarah Trills had any type of partner or any type of person that she had any type of good closure with? And if so, could you tell us about their relationship? Thanks. From just... From just someone. Sarah R. Trills was the head developer and the project director of Chess Kids, also known as Chess.com. She was a bright, creative individual who worked effortlessly with her team to create something very special. Something that would permeate culture and generation. She worked with a small team of lead developers, all of which we have not been able to get in contact with. Most likely they have moved on from caring. She got along well with people and co-workers and classmates had stated she excelled in everything she worked in and was very professional, but still with a fun side. While having other core lead developers, many people were part-time employed to work on chess.com, being able to experience the magic firsthand and be able to be a part of something as special as Chess Kids. Hope that answered your question. This one reveals important information as well. It seems like overall the website is idolizing Sarah almost as if she was some divine entity and capable of doing wrong because this is a little hyperbolic at this point with this answer. Saying that she's excelled in everything that she's worked in is a bit of a stretch. Hey Chess Kids Archive. Have there been any urban legends surrounding Chess Kids? Websites like it tend to have people overreacting. From Xander. Hello Xander. Thank you for submitting your question. Chess.com being a piece of lost media can, for sure, make some people draw wild, crazy conclusions about the project and the people behind it. Which, trust me, we have heard the blunt of these things. Our team is more interested in getting real, factual material from ChessKids slash Chess.com rather than listening to people fear monger and spread false lies about our operation and the website we are looking into. Urban legends and theories are just part of the World Wide Web, so we usually don't take anything that sounds too crazy too seriously. But if anyone has any leads or real pieces of evidence, especially relaying sources to get into contact with the development team of Chess.com, please email us at chesskids at gmail.com. Thanks. And that's the end of the Q&A page. Returning to the homepage, we see a bit of a summary of what the website is to anyone that may be stumbling upon it accidentally. What is this, anyway? Chess Kids, also known as Chess.com, was an entertaining educational website created in 2000. A fun game for people who like to play and have fun. The website was full of games, music, activities, videos, and even more. Created by a team of young, aspiring developers that, since 2004, has been considered lost media. A team so dedicated that they put their blood, sweat, and tears into it. Full heart and hard work, only to have it fade into obscurity. So, we have started a community, Outpour, to help find this classic website from our youth, so it will be more than just the memories. On our YouTube, we upload video content, either from our archives or audience submissions. Real ones only, we don't want to spread misinformation. Our Instagram and Twitter host both community conversation as well as further submissions and graphics slash audio relating to chess.com. So please, stay a while, kick back, grab a pop, and enjoy what we have found for you. P.S. We try and update our website and other platforms as frequently as possible, so always check back to see if we have more to show you all. Email your findings to chesskids at gmail.com. If we go down further, we find this door, which also leads to an unlisted video on the channel that we're not going to talk about yet. Then we have more text. Our mission. Our goal is to bring this piece of nostalgia from our memories back to the limelight, in even the smallest way. Our team is hard at work, always trying to get as much information we can with chess.com slash chesskids. So, and then it just cuts off. Then there's a link to a newer page which shows character profiles for many of the chesskids characters and plays some music.
There isn't much here in the realm of relevant information, but there are a few things to note. Lola the Pink Cat was originally voiced by Ellen Masterson, but was later changed, and apparently, Kabuko's Japanese dialogue and text was all translated either by an in-development team Japanese speaker or through automated programming. Her name may be referring to the Japanese word kabu, meaning turnip. If we scroll down to the bottom after this, we see a very low quality picture of the character who asked for oil previously, if you remember them. This image is actually clickable, which leads to what seems like a glitched version of the same page with different audio. If you scroll down to the bottom and click the image again, you're met with a prompt that says nosy nosy, and a different song plays. This time the page repeats many more times and is much longer. And if you go down far enough, you find these images. If you go all the way to the bottom and click again, this happens. It is difficult to spot, but if you focus, you can see there is text that blends with the background here. Upon opening the HTML source code for the website, the text can be easily read. Where did you go? Please stop lying to me. And the requested page was not found. Repeating over and over again, and at the bottom, an image titled, The Way You Made Me, that JPEG. And if we take a look at the alt text in the HTML, this is actually a reference to the words, the way you made me say sorry. This looks like a picture of Harrison. This ends the rabbit hole from this specific spot, and we can check out the two important links left on the homepage. New findings just leads to a video we've already seen, but the photo of the barn is a clickable link that leads to a page labeled, A Conversation and the URL says, Memories. A song is playing. The background looks like a shooting star and the night sky in an open field. And this page also has text. I'll go ahead and read the conversation out loud. 11.08. And right about here. Whoa, you can really see the sky from here. This can be our little spot away from all of that junk. Can I ask you something? Is everything okay? Yeah, it's just all of this. You aren't making sense. I just want things to stay like this. Yeah? What is it? Your smile. It's cute. Not as cute as yours. Your lips are like cherries. You flatter me. I'm so lucky. You have no idea. Trust me, I am the lucky one. You're warm. Here, it's getting late. We should get out of here. Will I see you tomorrow? Of course. And if we scroll way down past the main section, we get one more partial sentence. A few kisses ago. Now it's important to remember the lips are like cherries line is a direct callback to one of Harrison's poems. So this is just definitely a conversation between Harrison and Sarah. And a few kisses ago might imply that it might not even have taken place that long before everything went bad. This is crucial insight into how their relationship was at some point. They had a genuine passion for each other and they really did love each other. Now, I would like to immediately propose a setting for this conversation to have taken place in, but it's going to be a lot easier to convey when we have the evidence from the next page that I want to talk about. The last link of the page, which is labeled nosy 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 leads to this page i'm not sure what the background is meant to be but the text says who are you running from my old treehouse was right there haha <laughs> the url is labeled as mayhill farms which is the same name as harry's farm on the website an image below the main text shows sarah and harrison's initials together and the last thing on the page is a link labeled blue heart which also leads to the second channel this web page referenced a treehouse, and the song that played on the last page, which is the audio you're hearing right now, is labeled under the tree.mp3. I think it's entirely possible that this treehouse was a sort of special place for Sarah and Harrison to meet, despite their parents not exactly liking each other, whenever they wanted to see each other. The last thing on the homepage is a gif of a key labeled sing.gif, and that's all we have on the surface level of the website. However, 
It is important to note that there are far more links to explore, and I'll go ahead and show you all of the ones that have been found so far, at least the ones that are relevant to this portion of the video. You may have noticed that Woodsy wasn't present in the original character page, but on the URL Woods, she has entirely taken over a copy of that page. This picture of her is labeled as crunchy.png, which may be alluding to something that I'll discuss in the theory section later on. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there is a bit of dialogue that we can read out. We need to talk. Now. God, will you calm down? You are always crying. Can you stop? I miss when you were smiling. Smile for me, please. I want you to smile. I want us to smile. Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? And it's repeated over and over and over again until at the bottom, we're met with a picture of a disfigured face that can be clicked on, which leads to, I saw you. Playing disturbing distorted audio to accompany the face with small text at the bottom reading, I truly thought you believed in me. Interestingly enough, if you actually download this MP3 and look at the details in the file, it leads back to another song, Roy Orbison's Crying. The song that played on the original Slash Woods page was actually a distorted version of this song, so it makes sense. Visiting the URL extension Smart leads to another distorted version of the character page. The background on this one is completely different, and all of the text leads back to a previous page we saw I Could Just Smile. Towards the bottom of the page, there is also a high quality version of the background image that we can now read. It says, Dev note for all programmers. ST. Hello. I wanted to leave this message for the lead programmers and rest of those working on this game. As much as we appreciate the work you are doing, please think about trying a little harder. We are trying to make a serious project here that will stand the tests of time, and the product that me and the other supervisors have seen is lackluster at best. To say it bluntly, pull your shit together. Chiz.com needs your help, and if you aren't willing to put in that effort and make something groundbreaking, leave your resignation notice on my desk. We are a team, but everyone must pull their weight. That means all of you. Feedback is less positive than projected. If the glaring issues, i.e. unfinished minigames, errors in loading, glitched assets, audio errors, etc. are not dealt with, major consequences will follow possibly a pay decrease and or termination. We are a family. Chess.com needs you, so please do your very best. If not for me, then for the millions of people who will love what we create. ST. Remove texture when done reading. If we were to actually click on the image itself, whose file is named placeholder.png, we are led to this familiar page, but instead using the URL, hello, hello, hi, happy. It is worth noting that if you enter a URL that isn't actually available, it will always default to this exact page, which is likely why the requested page was not found is a repeated phrase in the text in the background. The URL uh-oh leads to a page that contains the really messed up picture of Sarah's face that I'm not going to show again, albeit in slightly worse quality, with three lines of text saying uh-oh, followed by a really big uh-oh covering most of the screen. There's also audio to accompany this page, which is just five seconds of rather loud white noise. Pretty is one I know for a fact was discovered through brute force by entering random things into the URL, and it contains a low quality picture of Sarah, the word talker, and a short audio file that doesn't really seem to mean anything. The tab is labeled isn't she, which is probably a continuation of the URL extension. Isn't she pretty? The picture of Sarah is named everlasting.png. Hopping, which is a word from one of Harrison's poems, leads to a page with the poem used as the background, with a clown or jester seemingly overlaid sideways on top of it. The background is called slash liked this one.png, and the clown image is named present.png. 
Upon clicking on the clown, we're led to hopping with two G's at the end, which has disturbing audio and a repeated sunset background labeled slash wish. The audio is labeled what will make him happy dot mp3. Now, before we go any deeper into the website, I do need to finally go back to that second channel. It can't be stated how crucial this second channel's context is for our understanding going forward, and I'll also be discussing the various ciphers and clues that were solved through various social media and other locations that gave us even more hints. Let's go ahead and begin our analysis of the second channel, Alhenna Hydrothrosis Veranda. For starters, the name of the channel and the first video are themselves an anagram for Sarah and Harry Lovers in Death. Because of this, it may be safe to assume that both of them are dead. Speaking of the first video, it kind of just seems like nonsense. I, I can't possibly make out what's happening here. The third video is about 30 seconds long and is titled No Cheating. There's two fun details that we can note here. First of all, the no cheating in the title is a callback to the background image from the missing URL pages on the website, which have the same name, and the thumbnail is a callback to the red Gerbera daisy flowers that Harry has on his farm. The background is very low quality, but it seems like it could easily be some kind of gore that I can't really make out. The comments seem to think so, at least. The text on the screen reads, Chez Kids Tutorial, Akeshire Big Choice, and Embittered. Then the screen fades to the forest, the blue heart appears once again, which we haven't seen in a while, and the video ends. I'm not sure if this information is relevant in the slightest, but the audio in this is a slightly slowed down version of Yankee Doodle. I'll go ahead and play it. <laughs> The description of this video says, You can't hide how ugly you truly are. The final video seems to be a clip of Harrison reading the Smiling Man poem and nothing more. Harry Man lives in a crying flat up on Crying Hill. He lived his snarly life. His name was Barbara, if I remember correctly. The visuals don't seem to convey anything too concrete, but I believe that hearing Harrison himself recite the poem was crucial in highlighting its importance. The description of this video says actions speak louder than words. You may have noticed that I purposefully skipped the second video, but that's because I wanted to save that one for last, and this channel also has a handful of unlisted videos. Most of them were accessed through ciphers left behind in video descriptions and scrounged from various pieces in Twitter posts, Reddit posts, or community posts, among other hints. I'll now go through the unlisted Alhenna channel videos in release order. The first one is named 2003, and it's a really low quality still image of what looks like a severed head. Uh, whether or not it's Sarah's or Harrison's or something else entirely is not something I really know. Uh, I don't really know what this video means, honestly. But the video's description reads, this is where we planned on living, remember? The next one is, well, she was just 17. Which then shows what we can assume to be Sarah's mangled and presumably naked body? The description even says, If you know what I mean- No, what the fuck does that mean? Now, <clears throat> I know this looks and sounds pretty bad, and the community thought so too, because when this came out, they actually had to ask the creator, and they did receive a confirmation that essay, and especially child essay, is not an element of the ARG story at all, unlike some other pieces of media out there. In reality, the title and description were actually just another reference to a Beatles song. Uh, I saw her standing there. The next one is Play That Song Again, which is just five seconds of white noise with an image of probably Harrison staring at the camera, which seems to be a theme in this ARG for reasons we'll find out soon enough.
The description reads, You know I love all the songs you wrote for me, Harrison, and has a coded link as well. The next is called Sticking Your Nose, which seems to have something to do with the nosy nosy line we heard before. It's short and has a disturbing image to go along with it, along with text that says, Happier Times, mirroring the descriptions, Happier Times than MP3. The next is called The Forest, and this one shows a bloodied and naked Sarah in more detail than I'm comfortable showing in this video, though obviously there's no nudity or anything like that, I just am not going to risk it. It is worth pointing out that at the very end of the video, I Loved You shows up on screen. The description is another anagram that comes out to Sarah and Harry lovers in death. The next is Don't Raise Your Voice, which shows an image of a woman crying blood along with a song called The Spaceship Song by Tiny Tim. The description also says blood, sweat, and tears. The next one is titled Apple Tree and is one of the longer videos. For most of the runtime, it's a still image of a road and a forest that I believe we've actually seen before, way back towards the beginning of the video. It seems to be Harrison quietly singing to himself, and he sounds rather disturbed or panicked. Halfway through the video, this image shows up on the left side, mostly cropped out of the frame, and I don't really know what it is. After the end, the singing stops and cuts to Sarah's face, and ends with, His voice was so pretty. And the description responds with, I think so too. As a little fun fact, Harry was actually singing, Don't sit under the apple tree. any meaningful application for the rest of the story as a whole, but it seems like Harry or Sarah or both were rather interested in older genres of music. The next is Crying Over You, which has an image and audio that I can't even describe to accompany it. Uh, there's also various text in the video that says, I don't like it when they raise their voices. I don't want to do this anymore, and you have done nothing but hurt me, I'm tired. The video description says, can I talk to you like a normal person, for once? And links to an unlisted video on the main archive channel, but I'll get to that in a moment. At some point, a nearly three hour video that was just low droning audio was uploaded to this channel as well, but no one seemed to have been able to solve it. There is also another video here that shows the blue heart, and it seems to depict a conversation between this blue heart and the viewer, but unfortunately I can't really make out most of what it's saying, and with my current understanding of the series, I'm not sure what what I can make out implies anyways. The final unlisted Alhenna video is I'll Pick the Thorns. This video seems to depict a blurred image of Sarah's corpse and Harrison sobbing uncontrollably. He doesn't seem to have meant what he did to her, and even if he did mean it, he regrets it tremendously, obviously. The description responds to the title, I'll Pick the Thorns, with, So you can hold the roses with no fear. A reference to one of Harrison's earlier poems. Now, there are two more entries that are appropriate for this section of the video. Both of them are unlisted and on the Chess Kids Archive channel. The first of these two videos, The Lock, is only 15 seconds and has a cipher in the description that comes out to Embittered. The second of these I briefly mentioned earlier and can now talk about. It's titled 1998 and depicts a dancing clown sprite. Towards the end of the video, we hear the audio of Harrison screaming and its face is replaced with his.
Aside from that fact, we know it's Harrison because the Chess Kids Twitter also showed Harrison's yearbook quote from 1998, the only other time this number, 1998, was mentioned. The description, when translated, reads, Sarah Trills cannot be dead using the cipher Harry the Hopping Clown. And with all of that context out of the way, we can now watch the final video on the Alhana channel, which has no title at all. The text at the beginning reads, The audio you are about to listen to is a rebroadcast of the 2007 radio show Ken W1090 FM. The names of certain individuals mentioned have been censored to help keep those not wished to be mentioned anonymous. The young man in this interview was unable to consent to this audio being played for you. He is unresponsive. This is for archival purposes only. Please respect those impacted such as family and friends. This was recorded three years after the disappearance of local resident Sarah R. Trills. You may also immediately notice that there is a slightly hidden bloody face on the right hand side of the screen. This is basically going to be here the whole time. The interview then begins. Hello, my name is Kim. I worked on Chess.com, the project by Sarah Trills. I believe I joined the team in 2001. Sarah, she was a friend of my sister at the time, so I knew her then pretty well. Like, I'd see her around, and we, we've talked. Like, I knew she was, and I knew about Harrison. So, you know, uh, my sister being friends with Sarah, of course she would talk about him to a lot of other people. Uh, I know the time I worked there, which was like two years. There's definitely a difference in what the media was saying about Sarah and her local project and what was really going down, like, not what a lot of the articles looked like. It was a very different atmosphere from anywhere else I worked. I signed up for it and did a lot of the backgrounds for mini games and such, but the way that Sarah works the people under her was something that I had never seen before. Uh, if you signed up to be an artist, you'd end up also being a voice actor and a programmer and help with menial tasks around the workspace. Uh, even some music I had to dip my toes into. Everyone was really hands-on with the project, uh, whether they wanted to be or not. I was young, so, you know, I had no clue what any sort of malpractice would look like. I remember Sarah, like, a lot of the media that has been shown, like, in the podcast she was on for the Oregon State College campus. Uh, she's been shown as, like, a really innocent, sweet person, but uh, honestly, a lot of the issues I had were with Sarah, like, she would really not communicate with her staff, which of course led to things being late and past the due dates. Would she then blame on us? She would go on long texts about, you know, trying to achieve the next big thing, which like, we were hoping for a big blowout sensation. That mostly being because we got paid depending on the amount of traffic the website was getting and the progress with, that we made. Listen, I don't know where that ad got 2005 from, but I'm telling you, once the website disappeared, so did her. So yeah, it's I know when the website first came out, it was a total mess. Where like, random links would send you to pages not found, or some site would bug out. And of course, our audience being, well, mainly children, uh, people were sending complaints. Uh, parents of kids playing, saying that material being shown wasn't anything helpful to a child and criticizing the work of the team and she's like how dare you put something so unfinished and broken out for a use to see or something like that and i mean the rest of us we didn't think much of it but sarah took it very personally after the interview with uh or your b uh, it was only downhill from there where are they now man i have no idea i stay in contact with a couple of people since i left in 2003 but those relationships uh, fizzled out. Uh, I've been feeling this strange feeling ever since I left. It might be the medication I got on around the same time, but it's the feeling of... It's the feeling of being watched. It's horrible. This interview opens our eyes to a lot. This is the first time we've heard anything from a Chess Kids developer aside from Harrison or Sarah, and it's a good look at how working there actually seemed to function. Now, the biggest question mark is why this developer is unresponsive and cannot consent to the audio being played publicly. 
and the fact that the Chess Kids archive has been unable to contact any developers at all, not just this one, uh, raises a few more eyebrows now that we know this information. This means that at the very least, the archive is not taking place in 2007, because otherwise they would have been able to contact this person. But who is this interviewee? Well, remember Lowell underscore M9? On September 10th, 2022, the Alhenna Reddit account made an encrypted post. Upon solving the cipher, it led to a brand new Chess Kids page, my blog. There's a lot to look at here. It's almost like a second homepage within the website. For starters, I'll go ahead and read all of the text and then start exploring the links. Hey, it looks like you found me. Welcome to my blog. Hi, my name is Mark aka Lowell underscore M9, Mar Lowell, M09 Lol, or whatever alter ego I cook up. This is my blog. Here I will post updates about my life, current interests, sweet music I listen to, and whatever stuff I feel like putting here. This is an image that Maddie x 77 made of me. I look like an absolute div. <sighs> my favorite hobbies, obscure media, badass music, internet mysteries, retro games, hoaxes and myths, hanging out at the mall with friends, browsing forums, nostalgia. Facts about me. Nothing. I'm an enigma. I go too high in... My favorite foods are a Reuben sandwich and coke or chips and salsa. I have a dog named Ruby. She is four years old. I am an aspiring screenwriter. Click the links to view my work. My favorite video games are Earthbound, Escape from Hell Towers, Newgrounds, Sonic R, and Jet Set Radio. Got my Dreamcast finally a year ago. I am a relatively friendly person. If you are cool, we can chat. My biggest fears are the ocean, being alone, and scopophobia, fear of being watched. Currently listening to Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness by the Smashing Pumpkins. Links, blog posts here. See my top music artists here. See my top movies here. See something crazy here. Something funny here, and something scary here. And finally, towards the bottom, Ostia Subjibwe, whatever the fuck this means. It's a, it's a cipher or an anagram or whatever. We haven't solved it yet. Assuming it even means anything, it might just be the creator fucking with us. Who knows? Now, we've been introduced to a new character here, Mark, obviously. Not really a new character since we already knew him. And Maddie, if you remember from the Q&A before, Maddie actually sent in a question to the archive. And we have also know that Mark has other friends that are unnamed. We also learned an awful lot of personal information about this Mark individual, which means he's definitely also important especially considering he was referenced a long time ago. The things that I think are most important to note here is that he's into obscure media, internet mysteries, hoaxes and myths, and nostalgia. Sounds like the perfect person to be running a lost media archive, no? Another thing that I think is worth noting is his phobia, scopophobia, the fear of being watched. This ties back into the consistent imagery of eyes facing towards the camera and like the nosy nosy thing that we've seen time and time again throughout the ERG. It's the feeling of being watched. It's horrible. The first link we can click on is Mark's portrait on the right side, which leads to the URL what it says. It contains two images that I don't quite understand, but we can tell this person is Mark because of the mustache and he seems a little rattled. It is also worth mentioning that the top image is labeled goodbyeforever.png and the bottom nevermore.png. The first of which is a line you received from Woodsy, if you remember that. When we head down towards the links, there's six things that are available for us to explore. The first one, blog posts, just leads to the sound compilation video that we've already covered that didn't seem to have anything significant in it. Though it does make me slightly reevaluate and think that the person at the end of the video could actually be Mark. It does kind of look like him. The second leads to key, which realistically you could have figured out on your own considering the gif on the homepage at the bottom is a key. 
It leads to a page using the same background color as another from earlier that had a picture of Sarah on it, and also contains the Nevermore image I just spoke about. The next two links are rather strange in that they lead to the default missing pages, but with special URLs, both representing chess pieces, knight and bishop. Unfortunately, the community doesn't seem to have any semblance of an explanation for these yet, so this is going to have to remain a mystery in this video. The next one, something funny, does actually lead to something funny. The last in this set, Something Scary, literally just leads to the homepage of the website, except the Valentine's Day song is playing. Finally, if we scroll all the way to the bottom, we find this weird counter that we can click on. It leads to the NCH URL, a page full of blue hearts with faces on them labeled with a question mark on the browser tab. Now, on October 2nd, 2022, the Chess Kids Twitter posted a cipher that led to a separate, more personal blog of marks on the URL just blog. You can also access it by clicking on a link from the blog homepage. I'm going to go ahead and skip a lot of the early entries since they're literally just Mark talking about his life, but of course you can always go read the whole thing yourself. May 27th, 2007. Today, I spent a lot of my day online chatting with some friends. I got in touch with some new people in the mysteries category who knew about the stuff I always post about. Me and my friends were messaging them back and back and forwards. Hung out at the Zared Diner with people and had a tasty strawberry shake and my friend Maddie got a root beer shake. It was okay, very, very sweet. Feeling good. July 10th. Boring summer so far. Been keeping in touch with friends, luckily through my MySpace and chat rooms. Been working on my resume a ton, but I can't ever get it right. Hope you are doing well, Maddie. Miss you a ton. I've been trying to run the file dumps you sent my way. It's been sort of tricky, but I can feel something coming. It won't just be in our memories anymore. Also recently, before I forget, I got a copy of Charlie in the Chocolate Factory from my local video store on sale for $2.99 bargain bin. September 2nd, 2007. Things could be better. October 9th, 2007. Had a fun day today. Work was a long shift to get extra money. Planning a fun party for Halloween. Me and Percy are setting up one at his place. Or should I say his grandparents' place while they are in the Bahamas for vacation. Weird being one of the first parties I'm going to that isn't when I'm in school. Probably going to be a large turnout. Hopefully you are there and I'm excited a lot. Maybe write what I should be for Halloween in my guest book. I'm thinking I'll swing by the costume store on my day off and buy some stuff. October 14th, 2007. Went into the doctor's today. Just a checkup and minor evaluations on previous medical stuff. My twisted world. Also, read your suggestions, and you guys are so weird sometimes, but I'm glad you're my friends. I'm glad. Been feeling somewhat happy recently. Drew a picture. Might drop it in the blog for you to see. Sorry for being a slacker, I just like to have some me time sometimes, but we'll be as active as possible, planning for a big Halloween party. Edit. Okay, here's the drawing by the way. November 7th, 2007. Bye hi, Caleb. Like an older brother to me. Always. 1982 to 2007. Original date, November 13th, 2007, 2238. Does anyone else remember an old minigame from the chesskid.com where it was like a room where you could talk to what seemed like a chatbot? I have vivid memories of playing that game on my parents' computer late at night and just typing for hours. It actually helped me get better at using the keyboard in a funny way. Only thing I can remember is that it was like a face looking back at me from the computer, cartoony, not realistic. Anyone else have a similar memory? or any info on it if this is real or something my young mind made up. Thanks. M9. November 16th, 2007. Been thinking about the time we spent together a lot recently. I miss you so, so much it's killing me from the inside. Life is so unfair. 
I've been so down lately, but I'm still working and working. Trust me, I'm working on this project. It's so big. I want to show you when you come to visit. I wonder if you miss me as much as I miss you. I hope so. Sorry, I must sound super weird and annoying. I hope you're having a blast away, and I am excited to see you again. November 22nd, 2007. Nameless here for. December 8th, 2007. Okay, I need to clear these things up for a bit. Address to Flamis Dylan 440 on, okay, I did not make the Chez.com site? Like, what the fuck? I'm just trying to share my stories about my memories and I have Maddie to back me up. Her user is MaddieX77, so when you say I made it, it's really upsetting and makes me angry. That is why you post fake information and false screenshots to the chat, so haha. -ha. So whatever this is, just to let my friends know, I am not what this guy says. I'm trying to just figure all this out like everyone else. Anyways, besides that, happy holidays. I'm excited to see what I get for Christmas. Also, PPS, Flamis Dylan 440 is reading this. Fuck you. If you leave a message in my book, I will be so mad and... Oof. And as of now, that's the final message in Mark's blog. Though it is worth noting that the bottom of the page says under construction always, three times to really hammer it in. So what did we learn from Mark's blog as a whole? Well, seeing as his interests and attitude line up, it is overwhelmingly likely that Mark is the in-universe owner of the Chess Kids archive. There is also evidence to suggest that he may have a drug problem, as we can cite his self-portrait, doctor visits, general personality, and one of the photos of himself on his blog that's labeled psychedelic.png. Considering we have evidence for kids seeing strange things on the Chess.com site in multiple places, All I remember is that it was quite buggy. There was some game about a forest, and that it ran on flash. The rest of the website was pretty buggy. I think that all of the strange things we see are actually real in universe, but Mark simply shrugs it off as part of the psychedelics he takes, such as LSD. There's also the elephant in the room, Caleb. Caleb is the individual who was interviewed on the Elhenna channel, who we now know to be dead. Before I give away any of my other thoughts on this, I'm going to stop myself since I do want to save this for the section where I put together a narrative and theorize. For now, I want to devote a final section to talking about miscellaneous bits and pieces of evidence before we move on to that final analysis. Now, the first thing that I haven't talked about yet, there's actually one more video that we haven't covered, and it's an unlisted or deleted livestream that happened on the Chess Kids Archive channel. The contents of the stream itself focus on the corn from before telling a joke that we never actually got to hear. Why did the bowler break up with her boyfriend? Because she took him for granted. <laughs> break up with her boyfriend. Break up with her boyfriend. <laughs> break up with her boyfriend. <laughs> break up with the channel was also conveying a very interesting conversation in the chat through messages. Who is Sally? Do you have eyes? Educational fun. Her favorite. My eyes are like empty holes in my head. Mom? I can't see. It's your baby boy still. Can you call her and say I'm sorry I didn't let her know I was okay? I'm a turtle in a shell. My memory is empty. How do I not remember? Digital recording 802109. I heard she was chopped up into little pieces. I heard he threw her in a fire and let her skin melt off. I heard they ate her like a Thanksgiving turkey. You are such a fucking idiot. Those rumors aren't real. Maybe it's real. You don't know. This is a real missing person. Be respectful. This user has left the conversation. So, do you think those rumors are true? Probably just some dumb jokes. I'm glad we're in this together. I'd probably get creeped out if I was alone. Now, it should be overwhelmingly obvious as to why I saved this for last. At least for the second half, we obviously have a minimum of two characters, probably three or four, the prominent of those being Mark and the Alhanna channel interacting with him. 
If you remember in the Q&A section when Mark said that they had seen a lot of weird urban legends or rumors surrounding Chess Kids, I think this forum conversation that we're seeing depicted here is exactly what he was referring to. Now, for the first half of this, I'm kind of lost. I feel like this is a plot beat that we haven't really explored very much yet. I think they still need to be explored in the series. There are two more pages that we know of so far. Choices shows a beautiful flower field background and text that says blue heart, which is something that we've been seeing over and over again. 747000 is formatted like Mark's blogs and it reads, my head is fucking pounding, pulsating. What did I do to myself this time? Which is further evidence for Mark being a drug user. There's also an official Instagram, it seems, for Mark, as confirmed indirectly by the creator, though it currently has no posts. The bio on the account says Nevermore, which we've seen a few other times. I will be talking about the meaning of this word in the analysis, which I believe that we are finally ready for. So get ready for an answer to the question, what is Chess Kids Archive? I believe our story begins sometime before 1998 in the US state of Oregon, while Sarah and Harrison are attending the same high school. They do seem to have a treehouse that is referenced only a handful of times, but could be assumed to have been their special place. I believe that from the very beginning, Harrison was the type of person to be easily swayed and controlled by his emotions, which may have been because of a strict and slightly traumatic upbringing, as many people in the real world tend to have. I believe a few of his poems that we see were written around this time, including the one about the farm cat in which I think he was talking about himself. We know he also wrote music and sang as well, which I believe were all outlets for his emotional outbursts. We know this because Sarah seems to comment on it a few times. I believe that Harry may have lived on or was the heir to a farm, or a series of farms which were called Mayhill Farms and I believe his parents may have disapproved of his relationship with Sarah, and Harrison, being the emotional person he was, lashed out towards his parents. Obviously, neither Sarah nor Harrison listened, and shortly after graduating, most likely in 98 or 99, they got together and planned to get married at some point in the near future. I think it's around this time that Sarah and Harrison rented an apartment together, which would make sense considering the Smiling Man poem. Somewhere around this time, Sarah gets the idea to create a website. The early 2000s was the pioneer era for Flash-based game websites, and Sarah could be one of the pioneers of this medium. They got together a group of individuals, at least six that we know of. Sarah Trills, Harrison Michaels, Ellen Masterson, and Caleb Masterson are the ones whose names we know now. We can assume Ellen and Caleb are siblings because Caleb says in his interview that his sister was friends with Sarah, and he already knew about Sarah and Harrison. At the beginning, everything went surprisingly well. Harrison and Sarah's relationship strengthened, and Harrison eventually apologized to his parents and properly introduced his fiance to them. During the short two to three year period in which the website was open, a young Mark Lowell discovers the website and falls in love with it. I believe it to be entirely possible that Mark and Caleb knew each other before that happened, and that Caleb may have even been the one to introduce him to the website. We know from Mark's blog that he saw Caleb like an older brother, which means they had a deep and long-running relationship with each other. Somehow Mark was able to access a sort of chatbot minigame through the website. The website wasn't perfect, though. It was being created by a team of amateurs, after all, so it was bound to have some mistakes. Mark and many children like him started seeing some broken and sometimes even scary looking glitches and bugs on the website. Sarah was a perfectionist though. She didn't want it to be that way. She wanted to make something she was proud of. Something groundbreaking. So Sarah, stressed and frustrated, vented her frustration at the rest of the dev team sending out a dev note through a texture meant to be deleted after reading. She gushed about how the dev team was a family and that everyone needed to pull their own weight and have equal accountability. She essentially said that if you didn't have the same drive as she did, that you should resign or expect a dock and pay. This fundamentally fails to account for the fact that not everyone is guaranteed to care about a project you started as much as you do, 
and the confrontational and standoffish attitude of the message just put everyone at the dev team off and made them care even less than they may have already. It was around this time that Sarah, more stressed than ever, began to externalize her stress by getting into frequent arguments with Harrison and becoming even more embittered and confrontational in general. I believe at some point Sarah may have even forced Harrison to move back home alone or kicked him out as we know from the voicemails he leaves behind that Sarah straight up ignored Harrison for long periods of time. This wouldn't make sense unless they lived apart, unless of course it was even worse and she was ignoring him despite them living together. I think it is at this point that Harrison regresses into writing poems to vent his emotional frustration and where he writes the Smiling Man poem. We know that they never did get married though because one of the Twitter anagrams translates to we were supposed to get married, which means they planned to, but it never happened. This is where we start diving into a very heavy speculation in that it's, it's, it's more headcanon than anything else from me personally, but just hear me out on the next section. So one day, Sarah shows up to the farm, and Harrison is originally very happy about this, but I think she immediately seeks to pick a fight, and it may escalate to the point of Sarah proposing that they break up with each other or just straight up breaking up with him. Uh, it's also entirely possible that the breakup had already happened and Sarah just showed up to pick a fight and rub salt into wounds that were already dealt. The details of the confrontation that actually brings about the subsequent events are shoddy at best, hence why I clarify that this is heavy speculation. But I want you all to recall the second episode of the series. It's only episode 2 and at that point we had almost zero context for any of the events transpiring. With no context, it seems strange but ignorable. A story about a farm cat using the boiling water from his home to water his crops. Sure. However, I believe this story is a metaphor for what actually happens during their fight. It's important to note that at the very end of the story in episode 2, Sarah's face can actually be seen after Harry has entered the room with the water heater. I know I can't show it on screen because of its graphic nature, but the image of Sarah's injury to her face and neck always struck me as incredibly strange for a variety of reasons. Not only because of its high quality relative to other things in the series, meaning it's something that we need to see in that quality, but also the specifics of the injury. It doesn't appear to be any sort of cut, it can't have been poisoning, probably, and doesn't appear to be a burn from fire since her clothes aren't charred or affected in the slightest. But what about boiling water? Boiling water could severely burn her skin, resulting in a similar injury that does nothing to the clothes but make it wet with hot water. I believe that Harrison, whether by complete accident or by heat of the moment, spilled boiling water onto the bottom half of Sarah's head and face during or right after this fight. Sarah, whether by sheer panic or assuming that Harrison was genuinely trying to kill her, ran away into the forest as fast as she could. Harrison, who was too panicked to even understand the gravity of what he had just done, lost her immediately and looked for her for at least an entire afternoon, as we see footage of him searching both during daylight hours and at night. Eventually, Harrison found her body, but it was already too late. By that time, she was already dead. Harrison broke. He likely spent a large amount of time in a panic, unsure of what he should even do at this point, sobbing and having anxiety attacks. He knew that he had to do something with the body, so eventually he came to the decision to attempt to get away with it instead of being truthful about the fact that it really was an accident, at least maybe. He took off her clothes, burned them separately, and then started to burn her body. There's a few reasons why I believe the body was burned specifically. Uh, part of the reason why I believe she was burned is because the woodsy sprite that was named Crunchy.png, as if to describe her body following the process, uh, was present, and I talked about it earlier. It's possible that Harrison also cut her body into smaller pieces in order to either burn them and spread the ashes separately or bring them to other places easier, as there are several instances in which we have seen some things to suggest that. Another main reason why I believe that she was burned is because to this day, Sarah is still missing. Her body was never found or identified, which seems like a likely thing to happen if the body was burned entirely. And at this point, I believe that Harrison may have 
accidentally started a small fire because of this that quickly got out of control as he was doing this in a forest. I think he may himself catch on fire as well. Harrison, already an emotional wreck, doesn't immediately realize that he should act rationally and just kind of runs around in a frenzy and eventually just dies to the flames. This is the end of Harrison's tragedy, but Sarah lives on. I think the reason why that Sarah is depicted as being a parallel to Jesus or the Christianity parallels are said outright multiple times is because Sarah was loved by many people, just like Jesus was, and also died an unfair death, and also seemed to have been resurrected in some form after this death. After Sarah's disappearance, the developers disperse and mostly forget about Chess.com. Citing the July 10th blog post from Mark, I believe Maddie, who we know also at least knows of Chess.com, was actually the one to give Mark the original file dump that led to the eventual creation of the Chess Kids archive. I think us specifically being told of this file dump and the line, it won't be just in our memories anymore, highly suggests this theory. I don't know what else it could possibly be alluding to. This is why the December blog post Mark makes tells of a friend of his claiming that he made the Chess.com website. He literally has many of its assets and talks and asks about it so frequently that the connection from this friend is simply made. And who is the person that Mark cites as being able to back him up in this claim? His closest friend, Maddie, who literally helped him do it in the first place. Around the time Caleb is reminded of Chess.com by Mark, he agrees to an interview speaking on his time developing under Sarah on Chess.com. He doesn't consent to it being released to the public. Mark sets up a website and email and begins the Chess Kids archive. However, shortly after, Caleb disappears. This is when Mark says on his blog that things could be better. Later on, Caleb either having had his body recovered or pronounced dead due to being missing for a prolonged time is attributed in a post on Mark's blog. The reason why the phrase Nevermore is associated with Mark can be traced back to The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. We know this because Nameless in his blog is a reference to this poem, and the poem speaks on grief and death, which is a topic that Mark is all too familiar with. Along with that, the key The Raven was used to solve a community post cipher, all but confirming the connection. Now that Caleb is gone, he can only continue the blog by posting on forums, asking if anyone else remembers and if they happen to have any footage saved of it. We know based on Mark's behavior that he may or may not be a frequent user of psychedelic drugs such as LSD, which may be a way to cope with the grief he's still working through. Mark doesn't seem to be alarmed by any of the things he sees in the footage he receives of Chess.com, probably assuming that it's just the drugs that he takes. It is really important to note that we do have conflicting dates on both Sarah's disappearance and when the website shut down. If you remember from Caleb's interview, he says that he doesn't know where someone got the 2005 date and that she definitely went missing in 2004. Listen, I don't know where that I got 2005 from, but I'm telling you, once the website disappeared, so did her, so yeah. It is here that I believe Sarah, having not died a very justified death, is resurrected in the form of a ghost and goes on to haunt the Chess Kids website, and by extension, the Chess Kids archive. She also manipulates the information that both we and Mark end up seeing. I believe Sarah may also be responsible for the death and disappearance of Caleb and perhaps even more of the developers who Mark could not get into contact with, as Caleb disappeared shortly after holding an interview where he actively bashed Sarah for her actions and her mannerisms. I criticize him to work and she's like, how dare you put something so unfinished and broken out for a use to see, or something like that. And I mean, the rest of us, we didn't think much of it, but Sarah took it very personally. After the interview with uh, O-U-R-B, uh, it was only downhill from there. And he cites that he has had a strange feeling of being watched, a theme in this ARG. I've been feeling this strange feeling ever since I left. It might be the medication I got on around the same time, but it's the feeling of being watched. It's horrible. This is where I believe the antagonistic entity of this series, the Alhenna Channel, comes in. 
The channel seems to have a goal of showing the objective truth of the situation between Sarah and Harrison, and is actively making Sarah angrier and Mark more paranoid as a result. Mark specifically has a fear of being watched, and I think Sarah and this Alhenna entity are both watching him very closely. Alhenna aims to shed light on the truth of the matter. Both Sarah and Harrison, lovers in death, were flawed, emotional human beings. They both made mistakes, and both have reasons for everything to have gone the way that it did. Alhenna referring to Harrison as a clown, the one who killed the person he loved most in the world, and hopped around burning to death after he had the audacity to try and get away with it. It is also possible that Alhenna as a group or entity could also be interfering with the Archive website, as there is definitely information there that neither Sarah nor Mark would want to be there and for us to see, and Mark isn't exactly in a state of mind to be doing much about it. With all of that finally discussed, I think that our current main characters at play in this story are us, the audience, Mark, the owner of the Archive, Sarah, the person haunting the Archive, the other developers that we may not know the real fate of, and Alhenna, the antagonist of the series. The characters that I believe may be relevant in the very near future are Sally, Ellen Masterson, and Maddie. Even now, I have a few question marks left in my head. I don't really know what the blue heart means, what the significance of this oil can character is, what why these chess pieces have relevance in the story at all, what really happened to Caleb and the other developers, what really happened to Sarah and Harrison, and many, 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 many other things. It is important to note that the entire timeline slash theory I just proposed is heavily based on just that, theories and speculation, albeit theories with some evidence. And at the end of the day, this ARG is just simply not finished, it's not done. If you, the person watching this right now, want to be a part of uncovering this beautiful mystery, then I encourage you to follow Chess Kids on Twitter and on YouTube and keep up to date with the story as it happens from now on. The owner of the project is very thankful for all of the support the series receives and will gladly accept any contributions you have to make to the community. If you're interested in watching my blind reaction to the series as well, you can catch the stream where I did so archived in my live tab. And with that, I've finally run out of things to say. This is my longest project I've ever done so far, and it took me weeks of researching, writing, and editing. I'd like to thank Bloopal for recommending this series to me, who makes interesting internet horror of his own. Wisdom, who messaged me for hours about Chess Kid's theory and clarified many things for me. Bedrock Person, who has compiled pretty much every puzzle the ARG has ever given to us and, of course, Chess Kids for creating the series. If you enjoyed this video, it would genuinely mean the world to me if you would subscribe for more content like it and turn on post notifications so you don't miss a video. If you want to support me further, you can donate $5 a month to my Ko-fi to get access to videos like a week in advance, and you can also follow my socials and join my community Discord server where I regularly interact with my fans and just generally chill and have a great time. That being said, that's going to be all from me. I hope you enjoyed the video, and until next time.